and what you just revealed about our joint venture some years ago, I'm reminded of an episode that apparently happened in one of the BJP conclaves in which uh, Mr. Venkai and I do, wanting to prove his loyalty to Mr. Vajpayee, said we were going on a boat and the boat was sinking and all I could think of was what will happen to India if Mr. Vajpayee drowns. So Mr. Pramod Mahajan spoke later and Pramod Mahajan said, I was also in that boat, the boat was sinking and all I could think of was who will save me. <laughs> so I mean after what you have revealed about a certain very unusual initiative that was attempted uh, and I see some of my media friends here and I'm sure that's going to be the headline, BJP Congress attempted but failed. Uh, well, you all know the background to what we are discussing this afternoon, which is the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. But this is not the first time that the US has withdrawn from a climate change agreement. In the year 2000, President George Bush got the US out of the Kyoto Protocol. And his language was identical to that of President Trump. He said, India and China are not part of the Kyoto Protocol, why should the US be? 17 years later, President Trump has repeated that line. It is undoubtedly a major setback to an agreement that was negotiated in good faith a negotiations that took many years, but that really started at Copenhagen in 2009. So it took six years to come up to this agreement, negotiated in good faith, 193 countries. The US decides to pull out, but it will take four years for them to actually get out, by which time Mr. President Trump himself may be out, so the US may be in again, one never knows. But nevertheless, the signal is that the US does not want to be part of this international agreement. But let me backtrack a little. The Paris Agreement was not going to save the planet. Uh, the Paris Agreement was a modest step forward. It was a bottom-up agreement. Kyoto was a top-down agreement. Kyoto set targets for emission targets, reduction targets for all the industrialized countries. Paris, on the other hand, allowed each country to set its own objectives for the year 2020, 2025, and 2030. So it was bottom-up. Every country announced to the world what it is going to do to mitigate global warming. And the expectation was that there would be a top-down architecture subsequently for monitoring, for reporting, and for verification of these commitments. This was the expectation. So the Paris Agreement is a very loose agreement. The global goal was that we should have an agreement that would moderate the increase in temperature in the 21st century to no more than two degrees Celsius. Many African countries, many small island states wanted the temperature increase to be contained to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But ultimately it was decided at two degrees Celsius. The Paris Agreement does not achieve this 2 degrees Celsius limit. It actually goes up to almost 3.5 degrees Celsius. But the expectation was that starting with Paris, we will initiate a process, an iterative process, 
and every five years we will increase the level of ambition so that by 2025, 2030, we would put in place a robust international agreement that is monitored, that is verified, which countries hold themselves accountable to, and that would ultimately lead to an increase in temperature, mean temperature, by two degrees Celsius. So this was the achievement. So Paris was a modest step forward. It was not a destination. It was a starting point of a process, a starting point that went back to Copenhagen. And I'll have something to say about Copenhagen a little later. Now, President Trump certainly has walked out. And as we saw at the G20, mercifully, all the other countries have said clearly and categorically that Paris Agreement is irreversible. <laughs> that whatever commitments countries have made, they will stick to it, which is a major step forward. The planet, actually, it's not just in terms of global warming. Today, there is ample evidence to show that we have crossed all planetary boundaries, except one. And the only success we have had in the last two decades is in dealing with the problem of ozone depletion. This was a huge issue 20 years ago. The international community came together. A Montreal Protocol was signed. And all countries, of which India and China were the most prominent, decided to replace the ozone depleting gases which come out of our refrigerators and our air conditioners. So the ozone depletion issue, and now we have evidence to show that the hole in the atmosphere has been plugged to a very substantial degree. But all other planetary boundaries, whether it is in terms of carbon dioxide concentration, we are today at 400 parts per million, we have crossed the critical level of 390 parts per million, loss in forest cover, loss in biodiversity, ocean acidification, very important, which we don't pay adequate attention to because 50% of the carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed by the oceans. And the acidification of the oceans and what it is doing to marine biodiversity. So all planetary boundaries the planet is already over the tipping point, except in the case of the ozone layer, in which we have a good success story to tell. So we are actually doing a holding operation. So Paris, I want to disabuse you of the notion that Paris was some great achievement. Paris was a great political achievement. It was a great achievement from an economic point of view, but it was a suboptimal achievement from an environmental point of view. Because when we negotiate international agreements, particularly in the environmental field, and I had occasion to do this in Copenhagen and at Cancun, we always have three objectives. We have a political objective, we have an economic objective, and we have an environmental objective. And we have to somehow find a way of solving this trilemma. We have to triangulate. And what happened in Paris was that we moved far ahead on our political goals. We protected economic growth. But from an environmental point of view, we certainly came short. And we expected that we would, over the years, improve the level of ambition. Now, who will save the planet if the United States, which is the second largest emitter in the world, accounting for something like 16% of greenhouse gas emissions today, CO2 emissions, all greenhouse gases, who will save the world? Well, certainly, China and India have 
a huge responsibility. We may not have a historical responsibility, but we have a huge responsibility. For too long in India, our approach to climate change has been predicated, has been anchored in two mantras. The first mantra was, we did not contribute to global warming. You guys did. So, we have every right to pollute. We will pollute and 20 years later, we will do what you're asking us to do. That's mantra number one. And mantra number two is our emissions are very low. Because anything in India, my dear friends, is low. Because the denominator is 1.25 billion. And that damn denominator is increasing by 12 million every year. And it is going to reach 1.7 billion by the year 2045. So whenever you have, when Indira Nui comes to Bombay, she talks about per capita, emission, per capita consumption of soft drinks being very low in India. Yeah, per capita consumption of soft drinks is very low. Per capita emissions is very low because you're dividing, as I said, by this huge and increasing denominator. So the second mantra was, our emissions may be large, but our per capita emissions is very low. Which means that every Indian has a right to pollute. But basically that's what it is. You're saying per capita emissions. And this, has, this mindset has guided India's approach to climate change negotiations for years. In 2009, we made a decisive break with this. And the reason why we made a break with this was in recognition of the fact that there is no country in the world which has the vulnerabilities to climate change that India has. No country in the world. We are still dependent on the monsoon. 60% of our agriculture is rain fed. We have now a wealth of evidence to show that the 10,000 odd Himalayan glaciers are retreating, which has great implications for water flow in the North Indian rivers, the perennial rivers of North India. We now have adequate evidence to show that mean sea levels has increased. And we have a 7,500 kilometer long coastline from West Bengal to Gujarat on the other end. And millions of families living in coastal areas. I'm speaking in a city which is vulnerable to increase in mean sea levels. And the fourth factor which brings vulnerability to us is most of our natural resources required for our economic expansion, coal, iron ore, bauxite, is in rich forest areas. So the more coal you want, the more forest areas you destroy. The more forest areas you destroy, the more you contribute to global warming. So double whammy. No country in the world has these four vulnerabilities simultaneously. Monsoon, mean sea level, deforestation, and glaciers. No country. Bangladesh, Maldives are vulnerable because of increase in mean sea levels. They don't have the other three factors. China is vulnerable to mean sea levels. Monsoon is not an important determinant of Chinese economic performance. They are vulnerable to glaciers. Tibet is. But their natural resources are largely in Mongolia, out, in a Mongolia and Tibet and not in forest areas like in India. So they have two out of the four vulnerabilities. Bangladesh, Maldives, Solomon Islands, Africa have one out of the four. India is the only country to have four out of the four vulnerabilities. 
And so the argument that was made in 2009 was, we should demonstrate leadership on climate change because it is in our interest to do so. Because we are vulnerable. And there is no point telling the world, you guys do it, we will do it only if you give us money and technology. Nobody is going to buy that argument. So we must negotiate, not defensively, but we must negotiate from a position of strength and strategic leadership. This is what the Chinese have done. The Chinese negotiate tough, but they don't believe the rhetoric of their negotiations when it comes to domestic actions. And today that's why China is a world leader in solar and wind. India uses rhetoric in international forums and takes that rhetoric so seriously to cramp whatever it has to do domestically. And so this paradigm shift started in 2009. Let's get out of this per capita fixation. Let's get out of this fixation that we have no historical responsibility. And let's show to the world, we are vulnerable, we take the leadership, and name and shame these guys. That was the outcome. So we had the beginnings of the international agreement at Copenhagen, where incidentally, I must tell you, India and China worked exceedingly close. And at Cancun in 2010, and the, those negotiations finally resulted in the Paris Agreement. Now, let me say a few words on what India has committed in Paris, because that's, I think, of interest to most people here. When in Copenhagen, I first said that India will not accept absolute emission cuts because we need economic growth, but we will reduce emissions intensity, which means emissions per unit of GDP, there was a furor in this country. So the Indra's party attacked me in parliament, saying that I have abandoned national sovereignty and made this commitment. But I stuck to my guns, and I am glad in 2015 in Paris, the new government said, we will reduce emissions intensity. I had said 25% in Copenhagen. This government said we will reduce emissions intensity by 35%. Very good. It proves an old saying of parliamentary politics. Where you stand depends on where you sit. <laughs> so that's one commitment. You reduce emissions intensity, which means you're not reducing the absolute level of emissions but you're reducing emissions divided by GDP. So your GDP is growing. Your emissions are also growing, but your intensity is coming down. So this is one commitment we have made. The second commitment we have made is on electricity from non-fossil fuel sources. We have said that by the year 2030, 40% of our electricity will come from non-fossil fuel sources. This is very good, looks very impressive. But let's see what is the current level of electricity from non-fossil sources. Hydropower gives 17% of our electricity. Nuclear power gives about 3.5% of our electricity. So 17 plus 3.5 is 20.5%. And, and you add another six and a half percent supply, not capacity, from solar and wind. So 20.5 plus 6.5 is 27. Already, 27 percent of our electricity is coming from non-fossil sources. We have committed that 27 percent will become 40 percent. Not revolutionary, but significant, important. So 27% will go to 40%, largely on the back of a very aggressive solar program. And I'm glad that you have done 
um, a report on rooftop solar because rooftop solar is not the route that the government is taking on solar. Its approach to solar is the same approach which it has for coal. It is applying, it's a utility-based solar program. It's not a rooftop-based solar program. That's a very important contribution that you have made and I want to congratulate you for it. So that this is the second commitment we have made. A third commitment that we have made, somewhat of a bogus commitment, which is that our forests will dramatically expand in quality and in quantity so as to be able to absorb over a third of our greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. Because forests are natural absorbers, natural sinks for carbon. It's a bit of a bogus claim because right now our forests account for about 6% of absorption. And to expect that suddenly forests in India, when forests are actually being destroyed and cut, that the amount of forest is going to expand in India and the quality of forest is going to improve in the next 15 years, that the absorption capability is going to go from 6% to 30% is mind boggling. It's unlikely to happen. But obviously, nobody has done the arithmetic, and we have just put it in as part of our commitments in Paris. So every country has made commitments like this. And the expectation is that in 2018, there will be another round of discussions where the countries will agree on how these commitments are going to be monitored. This is absolutely critical. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan, he was the master of the sound bite. And uh, he would have a little card in his pocket for every occasion. So every time he would meet Gorbachev, he would pull out this card and he would read the only Russian he knew. And the card said, Provarai no, Dovarai no Provarai. My Russian is not fluent, but the words are Dovarai no Provarai. In English it means trust but verify. Trust but verify. So you trust in Paris, but you verify that trust. How do you verify that trust? And that's going to, that's, that is going to engage the attention of countries between now and next year. And every country, in my view, I took the position when I was the minister that we should determine what is in our interest. But once having determined what is in our interest, we should hold ourselves internationally accountable for that. We are an open society. We are a democratic society. We have parliament. We have CAG. We have a free press. So what are we afraid of? We have RTI. We should hold ourselves internationally accountable. But what we have to do, we determine on our own. And that's the essence of Paris. So what we have determined in Paris is what governments will do. But what is still not clear is how governments will hold themselves internationally accountable for these commitments. So the answer to the question that was asked of me, who will save the planet? I'm afraid the planet is beyond saving because, as I said, most of the planetary boundaries have been crossed. And what we are engaged in right now is damage control. It will be very, very, very difficult to reverse the course. So we are doing damage control. And hopefully, hopefully, with some technological breakthroughs in energy storage in the next 10 to 15 years, by the year 2030, maybe, maybe the planet will not be in as much of a jeopardy as we are today. Today, India accounts for 5% of world greenhouse gas emissions. We are number four. China is at 29%, the US is at about 16%, 
The European Union is at about 11%, and India and Russia broadly on par at 5%. However, and this is the warning I want to sound, however, if we go on the way we are gone on, by the year 2030, India will account for almost 15% of world greenhouse gas emissions. We will be number two after China. By 2030, we would have already crossed China in terms of population, and we would be on its heels on greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to make a large number of difficult choices. The place of coal in our economy, for example, is one choice which we duck, <coughs> which we have not said anything in Paris. How much of coal? Where is our emissions going to peak? And are we always going to use this per capita argument in order to show that we still have a long way to go before we reach the levels that you are seeing in countries like USA, China. In China, for example, the per capita emissions is almost 8 tons. In the US, is about 15 tons. In India, it's still about 2 tons. So it gives us a false sense of security, a false sense of hope, because there are so much of inequity and inequality in emissions within the country. So when you look at consumption inequality within the country, there are large sections of the Indian population which have already reached per capita levels of China, if not Europe or the United States. So I think uh, what I want to leave you with is the message that climate change is a global issue, but it's an issue that affects India the most because of our multiple vulnerabilities. And it is in India's political interest, it is in India's economic interest, not to adopt a moralistic position like we know moralism. Morality comes naturally to all of us, you know, so we can't help it. I think we need to be pragmatic. We need to recognize that this is an area which is actually opens up opportunities for strategic leadership. And with the vacuum created by Mr. Trump in the international architecture, this is a golden opportunity for India. By the way, the Chinese are already exercising this leadership. Xi Jinping went to Davos and spoke about the virtues of globalization. Unheard of. And he's talking about climate change. I think this is an occasion for India to stand up, to abandon its old mantras, which have served us well at one point of time. But today, when the world is crying out for leadership, by the way, leadership not through words, but leadership through actions. That is where I think the challenge lies. And I'm, I want to congratulate you once again for these reports that you have produced, particularly the rooftop solar one, which is of direct relevance uh, to the climate change, but also on sanitation and other issues which have uh, a great bearing on the environmental situation in India. So, friends, climate change is a reality. It's here. It's affecting us. We have, there's an old Upanishadak saying, Prakriti Rakshati Rakshataha. Nature protects those who protect it. The obverse of that is, nature destroys those who destroy it. We destroyed the mangroves and the tsunami destroyed us in 2004. We destroyed the mountains in Uttarakhand and the floods destroyed Uttarakhand. We are still digging out dead bodies in Kedarnath and Padrinath 
four years after the unprecedented floods. So environmental and ecological imbalance is already wreaking havoc in large parts of the country. We tend to think of income poverty, we tend to think of consumption poverty. There is also a thing called ecological poverty. Poverty caused by the degradation of land. Poverty caused by deforestation. Poverty caused by the lack of access to water. And that's why I think it's important for environmentalists particularly, and I'm sure there are many environmentalists in this room. Environmentalism in India must be based on a recognition that this is livelihood environmentalism we are talking about, not lifestyle environmentalism. Moment you get into lifestyle environmentalism, you're not going to create a large constituency of public support. It's when you make environmentalism an issue of livelihoods, when you make environmentalism an issue of public health, then you will get people, political support, people's support. And I think that's what we really urgently require. Otherwise, in the debate that is taking place, which I have seen in the last couple of years, ease of doing business is driving out ecological concerns. Reducing regulatory burden is driving out environmental concerns. This should not happen because we need rapid growth, no doubt. But at the same time, we need to protect the environment. And the most important reason why we need to protect the environment, I'll close with this, is not just because it's livelihood, not just because it is related to climate change, not just because it is related to uh, public health, but fundamentally, fundamentally, it is because there is no country in the world which is seeing the demographic expansion that India is seeing. Most countries in the world, advanced countries in the world, are seeing population decline. Russia, Japan, Germany, Europe, China, population decline or population aging. The only two exceptions in the advanced world are the UK and the USA. And there is no mystery why they are exceptions because of immigration from South Asia. You stop immigration from South Asia, birth rates in USA and UK will also begin to collapse. Then which country in the world is going to add 400 million people in the next 30 years? One third of our current population is going to be added in the next 30 years. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. The median age of the Indian population today is 28, which means that half the population is below 28 and half the population is over 28. By the year 2040, the median age will still be in the low 30s. So not only are we going to see an expanding population, we're going to see a young population for the next three decades, which has its own consequences for economic policy, for investment, for the nature of growth that we are going to adopt. And I think it is this more than anything else the demographic reality that is staring us in the face, this more than anything else, that should drive our economic policy. Some years ago, McKinsey came out with a report saying that 80% of the infrastructure required for India of 2050 has yet to be built. Why do we have to build that infrastructure on old assumptions? You have to build that infrastructure on new assumptions of climate change, of environment. And I think this is a business opportunity. It's a political opportunity that needs to be grasped by our country. Thank you.